Colossians 5, 1, sorry, Colossians 1, 15 to 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. John 13, 3 to 5 and 12 to 14. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. Thanks, Liz. Are you with us? You're still there? Excellent. My name is still Dave Kilpatrick. I haven't changed it in the last couple of minutes. The theme, the frames for Kerry 2026 is deeper and wider. And the theme for Kerry 2022 is deeper. If you try and go wider without going deeper, it ain't going to go so well. If, if you're if your stretch is beyond the strength of your foundation, something is going to fall over. But also from a, a context of ministry, if we are not deepening in Jesus, we don't really have anything to give. And so if, we're, if our, God is drawing our reach out, then we need to continue to be shaped by him. And so the, the, the theme for this year is, is deeper. But what does it mean? to go deeper with Jesus. The two readings from today present contrasting perspectives of this Jesus. The first one from Colossians 1 is, frankly, a terrifying scripture. It, it, we cannot comprehend the vastness and magnitude of that scripture. He is before all things. All things were created in him and for him. All things are held together. He is the image of the invisible God. Whether things in heaven or things on earth, we think about the magnitude and vastness of the universe and the extraordinary span of creation. And he is beyond and before all of that. That, that is just terrifying. Except for scriptures like John chapter 13, that speak of this son, this God, the one who is before and above and beneath and over all things, sitting at a table with a group of dear friends, disciples that he's journeyed with, and knowing that all things have been placed under his power by his father, all things are under his power, that he was with God from the beginning and would return to God. This awesome son got up from the table. He took off his outer garment. He wrapped a towel around his waist, got a bowl of water and began to wash the dust and the grime off the first century streets from the disciples' feet and then wiped them with a towel. 
Colossians is a terrifying scripture unless we understand that this king, as it says in Matthew, comes riding on a donkey, gentle and humble. And reflecting on John chapter 13, it, the disciples must have been incomprehensible that the rabbi, this Jesus, their teacher would do this. Peter wasn't wanting to have a bar of it. And, and they were beginning to understand that perhaps this Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. But I'm sure they did not comprehend that this standing up from the table was just the reflection of what God had already done and was about to do. You see, Jesus was with God in the beginning, clothed in glory and splendor. And we read in Philippians chapter 2 that he took off his glory. He did not hold on to it. And he came humble as a child and lived amongst us as a servant, attending to need and brokenness and pain, not to judge it or condemn it, but to heal it and set it free. And that he would, in fact, wash the feet of the entire world through his death on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. I think the passage of the washing of the feet actually gives us an intimate perspective of, of the gentleness and kindness of, of God because the bigger scale picture is just too far for us to comprehend. We, we live in uncertain times. We have no idea when COVID will end or whether there'll be another wave or what's going to happen. We've got no idea when the borders open what's going to happen and there's lots of fear and anxiety and uncertainty there's lots of conflict there's there's suspicion and belief in conspiracy there's there's heated arguments about whether we should be as an expression of love to the vulnerable vaccinating or whether that's actually just deeply wrong there's dispute and fight about whether lockdowns are appropriate or not appropriate there's, there's political divide, there's, there's fighting and infighting about the environment and about race relations, and even within the church. So if we are called as a community of faith to move out into the world, how do we do that in these times? Because it's easy to be anxious and fearful, to be defensive, and, and to to circle the wagons, to gather the tribe that looks and feels like me and affirms my view of the world and makes me feel better about who I am. It's easy to be critical and judgmental about the person that holds a very different view and exclude them and condemn them. And our social media platforms are feeding like petrol on a fire, these little circles of opinions and perspectives and division. And perhaps that's understandable in a time of uncertainty and division where people are disagreeing and we don't know how to be together. But if we move into the world like that, we will not be a flourishing community of hope. If I move into the world like that, people are not going to experience the love of God. They're just going to experience my own fear and anxiety and bigotry and exclusion. People are not going to want to say yes to a Jesus that looks like that. And I won't be showing God's heart of compassion to the world. I'll just be showing my compassion to people that look and feel like me. Or, or, or is there another way? Is there a way where we can rest into the enormity of one Colossians, that God is over and in and all. And I don't need to charge out on a horse and fix all this mess and whip it into shape. God somehow is at work. 
Am I able to rest in the reality of a God who takes off his glory to attend and wash our feet and reflect a God who says, come to me all you are tired and heavy burdened and I will give you rest. I had, um, I had plans this morning. I got up early. I was going to be at the office at about 6.30 because I really had some more work I wanted to do on today. And uh, as I turn around the corner, I see a, a poor old lady had tripped and she's lying on the side of the pavement in the fetal position and her face was bloody. And a young 16-year-old kid had just pulled up on his bike and I thought, oh, he's not going to be able to take her anywhere. And so I thought, okay, you know. So I stopped and, and said hello. This, this lady was disoriented and, and, and uh, it just... Uh, the shock, she was feeling nauseous, and she, she had landed, she tried to save herself, and she'd cut her lip on a brick ledge, and there was blood everywhere, and, uh, but she was still very lucid, and she said, I didn't hit my head, I saved myself, a and we sat there for a while and just got her some tissues, and she said, no, I'm fine, just take me home, and I said, oh, I think you're going to need stitches, I, I really don't want, is there anyone at home? No. I said, I think I need to take you to the hospital. Um, I'm, I'm just, I don't feel comfortable. Are you, are you happy if I take you to the hospital? She said, yeah, that, that's fine. And so this young lad, Troy, and I gently helped her into the car and, and she sat down and, and Troy left. Um, this lady was amazing. Through all of that, she said, thank you, Troy. And we headed off to the hospital and she said, I'm, I'm sorry, you were going somewhere early. Where were you going? I said, well... I'm speaking at church this morning and I had some more work to do, so I, um, I was heading off early. She said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, look, you know, I think if, uh, if God had me going past you just after you fell, I reckon God's probably got the sermon sorted. And she said, oh, what church do you go to? And I told her, she said, I, I go to Riverton Baptist. And so I took her into the hospital and got a wheelchair for her because I didn't want to walk in and took her in and uh, stayed with her for a while until they'd attended to her and made sure that she was okay, and, and, and then she had to go in and get the stitches. It turns out that she's actually the daughter of uh, some people we know quite well. Used to come to Kerry, now go to Red Door. And uh, I, I said to her, I suspect God was looking after you, that, that you know, I was able to come past. And things are going through my mind, like I've got, I've, I've got some stuff to do on my message. And okay, well, God, you know, we're not anxious and driving away, I thought, you know, what a lovely example of just being able to surrender things to God and trust Him. Um, but the problem is, that was, that was kind of making me look good. And I've realized that God's rarely in, keen and were interested in making me look impressive. But He's really keen in making me look like Jesus. I see, the problem was there was another lady in the emergency department and she was having a really bad day and uh, she was loud and aggressive and she was biting everyone's head off and she was, she was not in a good way. And as I drove her away thinking, I, I don't think I've got this yet, God, what's going on? He just prompted me to reflect on the difference between my heart and compassion for this little Christian old lady and this other lady who was aggressive and loud and in a world of pain. And I realized that actually God had this lady. She's been shaped by his grace and goodness for decades. And he said, oh, I'll, 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 she's going to need someone. I'll delegate one of my kids to that. But I realized the compassionate heart of God that actually pursues the lost sheep was more concerned about the plight of the woman who was noisy and angry and aggressive. And I was profoundly convicted by the difference between my compassion and the way I saw this little old lady and the way I saw this other woman. And I realized just the extent to which we still judge and evaluate and critique. And I do not see this woman who was in a world of pain with compassion and kindness and profound concern 
that would cause God to get up from the table and take off his robes and wash her feet. I thought, oh, Lord Jesus, I think that was the purpose. God never does one thing at a time. So I was able to help Wendy, which was lovely. I think what God was really showing me was the extent to which I still have much work to do in learning to love like Jesus. In learning to surrender the fact that actually God has got this. I don't need to fix anything. I've just got to continue on the journey of following Jesus and allowing him to shape me and teach me to love my neighbor, irrespective of what they look like or my opinions or whether they agree with me or whether they make me feel uncomfortable or whether they actually are my enemy. God looks at us the same. As we go deeper, I think that is the journey that we're on. To be able to see people with the eyes and compassion and tenderness of Christ. And to realize how difficult we find that and to allow him to continue to shape us and surrender into something bigger and deeper. So that we might go gently into this world, tending to the needs and heartaches of those that Jesus loved, being with the stories and laughing with those who laugh and weep with those who weep. Perhaps if we say yes to that invitation, perhaps we will become a flourishing community of hope. Perhaps then people will actually experience God's love through me, even though I'm just a cracked pot and a broken jar perhaps then people will actually want to say yes to the Jesus whose life miraculously is reflected in me and my capacity to see and love not because of who I am but because of who he is that's a Jesus I want to say yes to perhaps then we will actually demonstrate God's heart of compassion to the world that goes to the margins that goes to the broken, that prays for those who nails him to a tree. Perhaps then we'll be known as disciples of Jesus, not because we've got Baptist in our name, but because of our love for one another. Perhaps then it will be said of us, irrespective of to whoever it is, they will love you. I've got a long way to go. But I'm can't encourage because Jesus is calling us deeper. He's calling us to be a flourishing community of hope. And the only we can is by following him. Lord, we love you. We need you. And we have no idea how much. Lord, we believe and will follow you. Would you help our weakness and shape our hearts? In Jesus' name.